This week's episode of Modern Art Family Tree is brought to you by The Foster Gallery. The Foster Gallery is a gallery in Worcester, Massachusetts, who specializes in paintings, drawings, and prints. Find them at www.thefostergallery.com. I don't know how they did that photo. You know what I mean? He's sitting behind the easel, but he's also sitting in the chair posing for himself. Yeah, yeah, I saw that one. That looks like a double exposure mock-up, you know? I think actually the Japanese one's really good. I mean, it's it's maybe a little demeaning, but... Um, well, what about the one of him as, as the, the unhappy clown? The unhappy clown. Oh, is that this? <laughs> we'll do that. Let's do that. He looks like a garden gnome. Doesn't he? Uh, so, we'll use that one. All right. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and get going here. Okay. Uh, am I on? I am on. Okay. Hey, everybody. This is Matthew Foster, and this is, um, what episode is this? This is like seven or eight now, right? We've done this for a bit now. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's quite that high, but it's at least six, I would say. Okay. And uh, uh, this is Modern Art Family Tree, and I'm joined again by Dennis Hart. How you doing, Dennis? I'm doing well. How are you, Matt? Very good. And uh, today we are up to Lutrec, Toulouse Lutrec, to be appropriate, right? That's right. And um, and uh, Lutrec is a is an oddball, I guess, is the way I would say it. But I mean, he's he's a great painter, and I think that um, both of us definitely are are fans in general of his paintings. But uh, I will say I'm more pinpoint on certain ones, and then I'm not as hot on the others. Um, but he's also just an interesting character in general for this right. for this time frame and everything. I would agree with that. I would also add to it that um, you know that his work will definitely show the characteristics that are, are prevalent in uh, post impressionist work, but they also kind of lead into sort of that that Art Nouveau. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Decorative, you know, look and feel as well. I agree, one hundred percent. He, I mean, the the poster art, and we'll show one later. But that, in my mind, that's kind of one of the lightning rods of getting Art Nouveau like really popular and, and becoming a thing. You know, that, yeah. now now that may be totally inaccurate, but that's the thing I kind of go back to when I think of Art Nouveau. You know. Uh, well, I mean, I I would never have classified him as that, but but you're right. The posters definitely set that off. I mean, we could check historically to see if. Uh, where he fell in, into the time frame of what was going on with the Art Nouveau movement in terms of the pieces that he did that, that have that look, feel. But uh, I'm, I'm kind of guessing that he was very early in it. Yeah, no, I, I would say that that's right. Being that he died in 1901 or something, I, I can't imagine him being, you know, having, having had much of it around him before then. Right. Well, Well, let's talk about that because... He's a, this is the part that's a little confusing to me sometimes. He's a post-impressionist. I think anybody would say that. He's a post-impressionist. No doubt. So, so as far as the modern art family tree timeline, as far as being correct, we're skipping ahead a little bit as far as styles go because we haven't really talked about the true impressionists and stuff yet. You know what I mean? But, uh, but at the same time, he died very young, so he's not really... I mean, he's still working in the post-impressionist era, but it's not like he was through the ranks of the impressionist and going into post-impressionism, right? Well, I, I kind of see him more as like a beyond the impressionists, even though it was kind of at the same time as a lot of them, right? I mean, a lot of Monet and, and uh, who, who, if you think of the names that come to mind when you say impressionism, uh, some of those guys were painting along the same time as... Yeah as he is and uh so i just see it as he, he was less interested in being outdoors in the in the you know oh yeah in nature and and in the style that he painted wasn't quite uh, it wasn't really appropriate for impressionism well Straight let's impression. let's start by bringing up the picture of him so that we can kind of talk a little bit about the personality before we kick into the paintings because they because Part of his story is his is his life itself, right? I mean, why don't you talk to that a little bit? I mean, as far as his background. Yeah, we usually start off this way anyways. We talk about, you know, where they were sort of on the social social scale. Right. Um, in his case, he was actually uh, very well off. He was born to uh, two, well, you know, a lot of the families, uh, wealthy, uh, high-class families, would breed, you know, would stay within 
their own. And so he actually is the product of Cousins, which is, of course, a, you know, a big no-no. And so it <laughs> created some, it, you know, some the inbreeding actually created some problems for him where his... Uh, his, I don't know if his bones didn't grow properly or whatever. What, what he's, I, sort of, he's what, a dwarf, and he had he had problems with his uh, with his bones breaking. Yep. So that's why his legs were very short. Yeah, and when I when I was reading up on that, uh, they actually ended up pinning a one of the diseases, and they called it Lutrex disease. Wow. So yeah. Was, well, you know, I mean, I, I imagine after this time, there hasn't been a lot of the the that type of inbreeding. In humans, anyways. So he was he was uh, very very short, right? Yes. I mean very. I mean like notice like like dwarf short. Yeah. yeah. And I think they um, considered him a dwarf. They did okay, and um, and so in relation to how that setup leads into how he chose paintings, let's talk about that because he's got a very specific flair of like nightlife and can cans and things like that. Right. Did did his did his, you know, physical appearance and stuff kind of feed into his hanging out in that crowd and stuff? I, I'm gonna say yeah. I mean, I, I I don't know if he ever you know sat down and said you know I do this because I feel like sort of an outcast and I just need to make myself feel like I'm part of everything you know. Right. Um. But I but you know there are two ways to deal with with. Uh, being, there are two ways of the, the I, I guess there are probably a lot more than two, but you know what I mean? There's, you can say, you can hide yourself and say, I, I'm not suitable for, you know, prime time. Or you can say, I don't care. I want to be a part of things no matter what. Yeah. And I, I think he chose that one, you know, and, and he made himself present in a lot of things. Um, well, I would say that a lot of his choices of, of subject were escapism type things of the time too. Well, and he lived his life that way too. I, I mean, the, part, I'm, I'm sure part of the reason he didn't live all that long, aside from his obvious, I, I think he knew. You know, yeah. I think he said, "I I don't know what kind of time I have, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna Party fill, <laughs> I'm gonna live recklessly." You know, and and he did. Yeah. Well, and he and he died at thirty what thirty six or something like that, thirty five. Something like that. Yeah, he he was definitely young when he died. So. We can I can document that too. I, I, I'll. Do some fact checking while I'm while I'm here. Well, um, while you're doing that, I will bring up the first painting, uh, which will be the surf uh, self portrait that we that we talked about, um, which is a very early painting for him, right? Yeah. And was, uh, was... and I mean it's very painterly. I mean let, let's talk to this a little bit. It's got I mean nothing crazy about the color scheme or anything like that. I mean, I would not, if someone were showing this to me today and knowing the era that he lived in, it would seem like a study not overly dedicated to Impressionism or post-Impressionism. You know what I mean? I, it kind of has a feel of like a little bit of Van Gogh, a little bit of Cezanne to it, but but it still seems very study-ish. But it's it's really the finished piece, though, too, right? Right, right. Well, he was also like 15, you know, possibly 16 years old when he did this painting. Oh, okay. So he's very young. Um, and so I imagine, you know, it was probably, you know, part of his learning. Yeah. But as you can see, it was pretty well established even by then. Oh, yeah. I mean, for, for that age, this is a very nice piece, you know. But, but, as, but as I've read about him, uh, he took a lot of criticism from teachers throughout, you know, uh, about his drawing, about his... Uh, he was always criticized by, by academics. Oh, really? Yeah. Which... I think, you know, it kind of explains a lot of why his work became somewhat distorted and, you know, he sort of pushed the idea that, you know, if they're, if they're going to criticize my drawing, I'm going to, I'm going to show them what I can do, you know, beyond making things accurate, you know, beyond, yeah, you know, with, with exaggeration is what he's, what I think he ended up doing. Well, it also kind of, it also kind of makes sense now that you say that of the, the subject matter and obviously based on the subject matter, the kind of crowd he was trying to please with his paintings were not necessarily the academia people. I mean, he, he was picking subject matters that were, you know, the, the nightlife popularity stuff. Right. And that's, and again, that's, a, that's, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? That to me speaks to the, to the, the point. I mean, in, in being educated, he got this chip on his shoulder. And so right. when he was away from it, 
uh, his his work is everything that the academics wouldn't want, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, let's let's bring up um, the second piece, which is the the toilet, greatest name for a painting ever. <laughs> and and we'll see the toilet be used as a name for paintings in the future, also, but also in the past, right? Right. Well, maybe we should point out that that you know, in French, that refers to the the room, the the restroom in general. Well, the the yes, the private room in general. Because that clearly is not sitting on a. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. That that would bring a whole new level of horror to this painting. There's, there's not a little hole in the floor beneath her. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah, France is not that way, at least. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, now now this one when when and again I'm not the world's biggest Lautrec fan. I do like some of his work. This is one of them that I do like. And um, I'll say that one of the first things that come out of my mouth when I see this picture is is the perspective, and and he's tackled a very interesting and challenging perspective for this picture and has done a, a great job i mean this is a, a wonderful piece it's it's full of action a little different from degas is that he shows the floor but it's not all about the floor the floor becomes just kind of a meandering figure in the background you know right i i like how he's he's directed us towards the distance without having things be in line, you know, as in as if it were just a, a straight two point perspective or one point perspective. It, it's it's, you know, things are skewed, right? That chair beyond her head there is sort of skewed at a certain angle, and then there's a rounded sort of chair beyond that. There's the bathtub, which is even slightly turned differently than the chair, I think. You know, so you you run your way up through that that background, and it's not like he's using any sort of straight academic perspective to, to get you there is just letting the perspective of each individual object do its do its thing yeah i you know one of the one of the parts of this picture that i always get drawn to is how he unlike unlike van gogh who used marks to make the planes to actually point you in directions you know what i mean he actually uses like marks for the reflection in the floor and things like that like that the floor seems shiny because of his mark making and scratches it almost looks like some yeah do, yeah you know and, and that that to me like those are the little pieces of this that are the the easter eggs if you will the the niceties that you keep floating around the image and you keep finding these little things that that are like oh that's that's a clever thing that's a clever thing that's an interesting use that's an, you know what i mean and and it kind of makes the whole shebang very very interesting and appealing and it becomes a puzzle that you're constantly going back to you know right we, we were talking about this before um before we kind of went live here but the the uh, the fact that it looks like it could have been done in pastels right it's mm. funny because it's oil paint so it is wow so what i'm thinking is he didn't use any sort of brushes of any of any great size you know he, he he overlaid a lot of just like you would with pastels he overlaid marks you know he was very much about the mark right his work oh, yeah. is very very mark oriented and um they're very directional often I mean, yeah. sometimes they seem they seem it, random it, it's but. it's almost bizarre because it it's an oil paint that feels like someone who's trying to oil paint with cross hatching and and like like techniques that you would use in drawing, right. he's well, using think, for painting. I think that speaks to his draftsmanship as well, right? Because he was very much that was his thing. I, I know he spent time in hospitals, obviously, mm. for both health and for both physical health problems and I think mental health problems. Yeah. And what he would do to get, I think, when he was in mental hospitals, he, the way he would to get himself out would be to prove to 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 the whoever you know to the administration or whatever that he was saying by doing amazing drawings he would just ask for his pencils and uh and draw until they said well this guy can't be too crazy look how well he draws you know? <laughs> and then it set him out again so so uh little that, did they know <laughs> that the craziest people can draw right <laughs> and, and 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 you know one could argue well they were just holding them back you know they're yeah, just right. time. but in another way you could say they were actually 
helping him become the artist yeah, he was. So. Exactly. Yeah, he, he would never be a great artist unless they didn't think he was crazy. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> that's right. I think that has to be a stamp on there, right? <laughs> you know, if you're going to be remembered 100 years later. Well, I would, I would love it if they applied the Picasso logic to Lautrec, and then you'd have the crazy period, and the, <laughs> the, the, the prostitute period, and the, you know what I mean, all that stuff. <laughs> So, well, yeah, so well, that that is a point that we should talk quickly about, and I know that we don't want to we don't want to overly ponder on this, but but he was a lot of his models and stuff were prostitutes, similar to like um, some of Manet's stuff and things like that. Right, he was definitely known for that, and he again was one of these artists that um, I guess it, you know it's never proven whether he you know used his you know hired his prostitutes strictly for modeling um, because it was I guess it's. It's pretty well known that that's not the only reason he hired them. Right. Especially since he had, you know, uh, certain communicable disease, diseases. So well, uh, well, I mean, he he died from syphilis, right? Right. I mean, right. or or at least con syphilis contributed to his death. Right. Right. Um, so True. yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it was pretty common knowledge that he was engaged in prostitutes. Right. Um, Which again, I mean, feeling like. Put yourself in his position, being I'm not making an excuse for his behavior, but uh, I was gonna say, you want to go grab your wife and explain this to her? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I just have to, you have to wonder, you know, feeling how he felt in terms of his physical appearance. I mean, he, he had fun with it and he did a lot of things, but deep down, you know, you, you don't know what that does to a person unless oh, sure. you, yeah, 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 and, and but I guess if the reason I bring it up is it's more in line with his reckless lifestyle is that yes. he was on a not to not to make it like a moral tale but he was be, you are correct is that i think due to his 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 home life his physical ailments he was basically on a self-prescribed path to destruction which which, which uh, obviously fed his work and we'll see that even as we look at other pieces but it also you know i mean it is part of his character it's part of his work's charm and, and I don't mean charm in like a cutesy way, but it's part of the originality of the work is that he's partly telling his story through these pictures and you gleam into that world, you know, a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so it is one of the fascinations around Lutrec is, is his, is his, you know, bombastic lifestyle. I mean, <laughs> you know, right, right. so well, interesting. Well, the other thing I would make a comment on, only because I don't think we have any more of this girl, but he did a lot of the redheaded girl, right? Yes. I yeah. mean, I mean, and there actually, are many, many pains. Um, I'm trying to think of what her name was. Um, she was somewhat known in the in the in the nightlife scene, right? Right, right. There was there was there was also a I believe a dancer that he was uh, known to paint a lot of too. Lugaloo, Lug maybe uh, was. What's her now, name? I forget, but... Yeah, well, actually, and isn't she attributed to making the can-can, right? She was, like, one of the one of the originals in that scene, I thought. I think she was very, very, very popular in that, yes. So, well, good. Okay, so let's let's move on here. Let's go to, um, you want to do... Uh, let's do my favorite one here, which is the Circus Fernando, uh, the woman riding the horse. Now, now... This is one of my favorite um, Lutrex. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know much about any story-wise to what it is about or anything like that. I, I just love the, the formatting and the, and the, the way the, the, that he's used the space and everything in this. Uh, very sweeping, lots of motion. I mean, th this to me seems like at the time, like one of those pictures that it would have been impossible to stage this. He would have had to like memorize some of this for himself you know what i mean right i, I think uh, i think he was there i think he sat there and sketched that's what i believe so so i mean this is definitely a snapshot type moment so they must have been going around in the circle over and over again and he kept getting glimpses you know would be my impression of this um, but i love i love the quasi exaggeration of the forms i love some of the simplicity like what you see in the in the hand of the guy holding the whip I mean that's almost like comic book cartoonish kind right, of right. image. Well, the making, whole thing is, and I think some of that has to do with the fact that again that you know it was it was drawn 
while things were in motion. So he simplified and, and, and exaggerated certain things, but also, um, you know, it's, 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 it's pieced together from sketches, I have to believe. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would imagine that. that. That makes sense to me, you know? Uh, but it, it's just fantastic painting. I love the color that he uses in it. You know, I love that the color is not everywhere, that this dead space in the middle almost helps it in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some subtlety in color. I mean, one of the things I'm drawn to is her, her shoe, which is this, it's a pink. It's like a it's, ballet slipper. It's a ballet slipper, but it's kind of muted. It's kind of in the, but, but it's, once you realize it's there, it starts to fixate. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like colors like that. He's always known to have these radical colors for the women's hair, like the oranges and the red and the, like he liked that. Um, and then, and then, you know, the people in the background are, are quite distorted in a lot of ways. I mean, they're not exactly overly formalized in how they're looking and, and trying to be, um, you know, uh, overly detailed, let's say. Well, but on, 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 to counter that, I would say they actually seem a bit more resolved than the larger figures in the foreground. Oh yeah, that's true. The, the people on the stands. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's because they were still, see, I, that's what I believe. I believe he was in his fixed position, like he had his seat at this thing. And so his sketches of them were, he had more time to resolve those. But his sketches of the people in the ring were actually so active and, and you know, loose that he just had to do the best he could with what he had to piece together a, a final scene. I, I would buy that. That makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. You know, the the other thing I'm drawn to is, well, I love the, I love the, I'm assuming it's like a clown on the far left, oh, yes. like half cut yeah. off, and that that kind of screams his posters and stuff too, you know. Mm -hmm. But but that's to me that's great. And granted, I have my whole interest in like early cartooning and all that stuff. But but also the perspective on the horse for someone who's drawn it on the spot, trying to get everything right, has a lot of really nice intricacy to it. I mean, it, it's it's. Uh, I've I've noticed in Lutrec the paintings I like I end up liking the tough positioning he puts things in and is able to pull them off. Does that make sense? That does make sense, and that's that's you know it's an admirable uh, task. I mean, and, you know, the, the idea most of us uh, artists would say that you want to choose something difficult to do but you want it to you want to make it look as if it were easy to do right you, you know you don't notice how hard something was to do because the artist has done it so well that it didn't doesn't they make it look easy yep and in this case you're right you know that a horse in motion especially from that you know for shortened right because his head is is furthest from us and his I tail know. is closest so it's very for shortened but yet it does look you know Oh yeah, there, there's about there's about a million ways to screw that horse up, and he found out how not to. Yeah, yeah. You know? He found a way to make it very believable. You're right, and yeah. and you know I love the this is this goes for all of his work, his figures, everything. There's a, something he'll do, whether it be exaggerated or not. There's something he does with anatomy that I think is is uh, yeah. is very impressive. I mean, sometimes things look like they're bending the wrong direction or whatever, but yet you still feel like there's bones in there. There's yeah. there's there's knee. There's that horse has I don't know if you call them a knee on their front legs, but you can see the sort of bone structure up in there, and then his hooves, and you, you can even see uh, the bottom of his back leg there. There's there's a horseshoe on there. You know, it's like getting yeah. that getting to that kind of accuracy is. It's really impressive. Yeah, while taking liberty on, let's say, the woman's, you know, leg there. Where, <laughs> where No, where it still reads natural, but you know there's, I mean, she would be anorexic if that's really how she was, you know? Well, and, and yeah, yeah. I mean, I know the one that, that's furthest from you should look a little bit shorter, but I'm, I'm guessing if she walked on those two legs, she would... Uh, right. <laughs> she'd look she'd, like Lutrec. <laughs> she'd be dragging one of them, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, so I mean, and the, and the, the, the ringmaster there with the whip... Is very very stylized. It's like a caricature, right? I yes. mean, the hair going back. Like, I mean, this is what we expect. You know what I mean? From yeah. like, there's a sort of unreal quality to ringmasters, to to the whole circus uh, aura, and uh, I think he's really captured that with this. Oh this yeah, character. that that ringmaster almost. I mean, the head almost has the qualities of like a muppet. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? 
Right, right. <laughs> like like you were making a hand puppet out of a person. Like like the way that the nose swoops right back, and then the and then the exaggerated chin, you know, and everything. Right, right. And everything they do is exaggerated, right? I mean, yeah. a ringmaster has to be overly theatrical, and I think that he's he's captured that in in the way he's he's drawn him up. I mean, the yeah. eyebrow. Just look at the way his eyebrows got this like. He's very animated, and he's, yet he's a still image. Yep. No, I agree. That's great. <laughs> All right, so let's put up. Uh, let's bring up. Um, now we have two that are similar. We have the Moulin Rouge one, and then we have the woman dancing in the middle. Which one do you want to look at? Do we want? Or I mean, we could do both. Let's start with the the uh, Moulin Rouge. Moulin Rouge. Okay. So this one. Um, uh, I mean, obviously a crowd scene in a nightclub, right? In the Moulin Rouge, I'm assuming. And uh, this one has more detail, if you ask me, than than some of the others we've looked at. Yeah, this is this is definitely a a, 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 a more worked studio painting. Right, more formal piece. And 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 that, the definite proof in that is that the figure in the center, towards the back, and, and standing beneath that taller figure is is him. He, he included himself in this. Oh really? I didn't realize that. That's him in the background with with, uh, with the tall guy. Who he was known to spend time with. I forget what his name is, but yeah, no they, kidding. They were, he's tall, and, and of course, this trick is very short. So they were, they were, they were, uh, you know, they hanging were hanging out in the nightclub. They were memorable. Let's just say that those two. Yeah. Yeah. So so this was his scene basically. He's putting himself in his scene. Yeah, I, I think this probably isn't the only time he did that, but yeah. Interesting. So let, let's talk about this a little bit. I mean, they, the, the colors are very Lutrec colors. Yeah, there's like a very strong white, right? Like a, the, beneath the woman's face, which is kind of the woman off to the, to the right, right? Yeah. Very, it's like when you take the flashlight and you're around the campfire, right? And you want to tell a ghost story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's what that looks like. But then not just that. I mean, you go over to the left, to the center there, and you've got the red-haired, the back of the red-haired woman. You can kind of see her chin and a bit of her cheek. And there's a very, very strong light kind of coming off from that direction as well, right? I yeah. mean, and, and this is the great thing about, this is what I love about his work and about the indoor, you know, night stuff is that the lighting of course is unnatural right it's it's like there's lights here there's lights there it's not like when you're doing the landscape and the sun is creating all of your light source it's all going to be from one direction right. here he's got them you know from multiple directions and he and and exaggerated from multiple directions at that yeah you're very right and it, and it kind of gives a weird aura to everything it gives a I don't want to say it's creepy. I mean, like, the lady on the right's a little creepy because you're right. It's kind of like ghost story lady, right? Well, not only that, but, I mean, the skin tone is a little bit... Well, it's green. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, well, and actually that was one of the things I was going to mention in the background is that green seems to be a color he uses for a lot of... Back, like, like it's almost like his mirror color, like what he uses for mirrors and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And because of that, he kind of dips it in other places also because you can see it a little bit like on the foreground, on the on the front of this uh, little like half wall thing. And then you see, you see it dipped in little places just to stabilize the painting, but it's a creepy green. It's not a, it, it feels like uh like oxidized metal type of green. You yeah, know? Or, or like something you might find on a very old piece of cheese that you find yeah. in the back. <laughs> It's it's Lutrec mold. I think I think we we've got to like we've got to like copyright that so we can put it on a paint can someday. We we should talk about the function that that does though. I mean, um, you know, it, it's a cool tone and it's a very middle to to light um, value. So it so it sets things back. You know, he yeah. I think it, he got stuck on this tone more because of its. Uh, its ability to set things a uh, distance, you know, an atmospheric perspective, I guess you could say, right? It, it's sort of setting things. It's like when you see the mountains way off in the distance, they're kind of that bluish, you know, they're not green like the trees that are on them, but when you see them from so far away, they become more blue. And if, if you create that um, on canvas, that, that helps set things back. And it's the same with, I believe he found this to be his, his way of, of creating that, that distance, that space. Yeah. Well, and I would also say that that green, while it's cool, it doesn't compete with the blacks. It doesn't compete with the, like if you had a, a harder blue, 
it would start coming back forward to compete with some of those other colors. You know what I mean? Yeah. And his stuff is general. You know, you don't see a whole lot of colors straight out of the tube. Um, no. Except you know, and 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 really bright areas. Which that is, that is one thing that I do love about Lautrec is the colors he chooses, the mix, the, the what he mixes. Some of them are really great colors for just a little emphasis, like like the the fur on this lady. I'm assuming it's yeah. fur on yeah. this lady's coat that has the great orange yellow hair. You know, yeah. she's right in the middle of the painting. Like that color for for that fringe of her coat is a really nice and you can tell that is definitely not out of any tube. Like he he went out of his way to try and make that that way. Right. And, and it's and a there's perfect like a certain color for it. What's up? There's a certain translucency to it too where you could see like if you could see through that, yeah. that fur, you know, to the wrinkles underneath the coat or to the to the layer of coat that's beneath it. It's kind of it's you know, it almost looks like it's it's made out of uh it's like a fake fur made out of mylar or something, something right. that's transparent. Which wouldn't make sense at this time, right? No, no, no. <laughs> but, uh, but it brings up another point, though, is that he never lets the drawings go. Like, like there's, there's no part of this painting that you can't see where he was sketching it and, and working from drawings and, and letting line be line. You know what I mean? Right. I think that, again, that, that, that comes back to the, it's very consistent in his work that, that that's a, such an important part of it is his drawing. Now, I got to talk about the lady with the white face because that just creeps me out in this painting. Yeah, I was going to talk about that, too. You know, it's funny. His, his skin tones, right, are, are very inconsistent. I mean, no matter what, we, 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 are, we do live in a world of many colors. But, yep. you know, when you're sitting in a room like this and you know that the, 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 the people that you're dealing with are mainly French, you know, true-blooded French people, yeah. the, their skin tones wouldn't vary so much, right? Well, I mean, it's it's and again, he's playing with the where the lights are and such. I, I think that I think that women to men, you could say that there's a big fluctuation in any genre of painting. Typically, they're very made up too. They, yeah. they are very made. I think his is an exaggeration. One, right, and two. I mean, because it's the nightlife. You know, part of me goes, okay, she's probably lit strange, but also because of the scene. It's also very believable that she's maybe just an overcaked, you know, whore type that that actually did look that way. Yeah, and, it's possible. And, and it's very possible just given that we're not we're not in a king's court here. We're, you know what I mean? We're we're yeah. not at we're not uh, you know, hunting boars in nature. We're we're at a nightclub where people are getting drunk and hooking up and stuff. So so I would not be shocked if he goes, "You know what? That's what Sally was wearing. That's what we're putting on her." You know that kind of thing. I mean, and again, it speaks to the whole people and, and places that he, you know, accompanied. I mean, it's kind of, it is what it is, as they say, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, so let's let's go to the other one of the woman uh, dancing in the middle of the crowd. And, and forgive me, I don't know the name. I think this is another Moulin Rouge painting, but I don't know the name of this one. Yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can dig it up quickly for you. So, so this, while you're looking it up, I'll just kind of give my little two cents here. This one, in my mind, is very much the sketch. You know, the the it's a painting, obviously, but he but he really retains line. He treats these like involved drawings, in all honesty. Um, in this one, he focuses in a little bit more on some of the faces, especially the woman front and center towards us oh, yeah she's her, certainly the focus yeah. Her, yeah her profile is more like a traditional oil painting uh, of the time a little sketchy but i mean more traditional of the time where you go one character back of the girl dancing and she turns into poof a cartoon yeah or, or very very simplified as well yeah and then also you go next to her to the guy dancing with her and i'm sorry but the you know he must be jealous of the long legs because those are nothing like what the real guy had to have been. I mean, it's nearly like horse legs, you know. Well, you're right. His his shins his shins don't bend are not you know concave like that, and that's that's part of my my you know as much as he exaggerated things. There's always a, like a 
it's a it's a disturbing bone structure that he's got going in there, but it's <laughs> right. So it's a bone structure nonetheless. Well, and how can you get the feeling of like the guy's shoes are very like oh that's that's great. You got a single mark doing how that heel is, and that looks really nice. But then you go up to the leg, and you're kind of like all right, you lost me. You know, <laughs> like that, like like I'm no longer getting this. And then meanwhile, you go over to the girl dancing. And the way her legs are is very, very believable and elegant the way that they're just a single line showing that, you know? Right. And right. again, I'll bring up again that, like, her leg that's lifted, that's a tough angle to get it believable. That's a tough angle for you to really feel that, well, that yeah, motion. Right, the back the back side of, uh, of the foreshortened foot there, you're right. That's yeah, and, and he pulls it off. So it's not like he's a dummy. He definitely knows how to get this done. But it seems like he picks and chooses where he wants to to be the rock star in that way. You know what I mean? Right, well, I, I think some of it, again, has to do with his snubbing, you know, of, of, the, of his teachers and that, you know, he wants to prove that you can get away with, you know, exaggerations and distortions and such where, where he was always you know told you can't do that right right i'm not finding this this painting is the, the title of it i'm sorry well, uh, <laughs> no we'll look it up and i'll put it on the show notes you know i mean and again this is this is where we get to you know our our normal show uh comment which is we're not experts and we found these images <laughs> right and, and we're talking about it as painters not as art historians Right, right. Yeah, we're definitely not art historians. That's a great. That's a great little yeah. time to point that out. That's right. <laughs> so, what do you got? Any uh, feedback on this before we move on to the next one? I mean, you got. I mean, obviously, he has. This is the largest crowd we've seen in any of his pictures. Um, but in all honesty, I mean, it's kind of the crowding is not overly. It, it seems fairly stereotypical of putting a large crowd together. But I mean, maybe you have a different feeling on that. But you see some of the characters repeated. Like I, I'm, I mean, I, I might be going out on a limb here, but if you look at sort of those those guys to the left of the woman's hat that's in the foreground, right? See how the smaller guys in the back? The yeah, there's like a group guy, of four guys. The guy who seems taller. Does he look familiar? Oh yeah. Uh, yep. And the other two guys, I think, also look familiar. Like they were also in the other the other painting as well. So I think he repeats some of these characters, you know, in his pieces. And and I did find the title of this one. It's called At the Moulin Rouge. The dance. The dance. Okay. So it's it's uh, you know clarified that way. So maybe maybe one thing we can bring up about this is we talked when we were talking about Degas about how he used the floors and how the floors were kind of like the they were a character in themselves. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I've seen enough of tricks where he does because he shows dancing and he shows you know uh, these interiors. But I don't think he uses floors the same way. Like, I, I don't feel... Uh, they definitely feel like a real plane. And they definitely feel like they bring a sense of a kind of color to the ambiance of the whole painting. But, I mean, can we talk about that a little bit? Is that They're definitely of a different ilk than Degas. Yeah. Um, yeah well, no, no doubt about it. Now, I, I can give you a few reasons why some of that might be. But the first thing I want to say about it is that th this, this reproduction being on my computer screen at this minute... And having been, having stood in front of this actual painting, I mean that floor does have a big impact. Oh, it does. Okay. Yeah, I mean it. It is uh, when you when you stand in front of it, it's 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 pretty impressive, you know. Um, so so, but but still in a different motive than the day. Right, floors. and I think some of that has to do with the way his shadows are are kind of drawn into it. Right, that the shadows, okay. in my opinion, don't lie so well. And there's reasons for that. I, I think he's some sort of out, you know. He's again so so stuck on the drawing of it that that his shadows become more drawn and have edges, right? Have outlines, which shadows generally have the opposite of outlines. They right. sort of they sort of blur out, feather back to yeah. to, the, to the light lit service, right? So um, that's part of the, the reason I think that his floor doesn't feel as natural to you. Hmm. Interesting. And his marks, you know, are a bit more abrupt too than than Degas were with the floors. Yeah. Some of the marks are, you know, he's got this nice one-point perspective going with the floorboards, right? Which, yeah. of course, what we see in that lower center of the painting. But then you look 
up and some of the marks that he's making around the characters or around you know just in there are sort of random i mean not they're not in, they're not consistent with that perspective that that strong one point perspective they're kind of if anything competing with it yeah well i i feel like i, I guess maybe that's what i was getting at with the floor being different because the, you're exactly right the one point perspective is really strong and and in some ways i almost feel like his his point that he's going back to is either like you said incorrect or or maybe just too strong for the picture i mean maybe it should be somewhere further in the distance you know what i mean because mm -hmm. this almost seems to point back as if it's going to go to one of these characters somewhere and it doesn't quite marry up with any one character well um, i think if it did it would go right to that guy in the center with the reddish jacket and the bow tie and the top hat <laughs> that's what i was i was i was thinking it's either him or the lady right next to him one of the two yeah. yeah, and it makes you wonder if if there's something very very important about him. I I I don't know this, so. No, well, well, that's that's, and I guess that's kind of what I'm getting at is if this was a painting from 200 years earlier, instantly you would assume that that's what that was about. Right. You know, oh, all of these things are pointing to this character, so there must be some meaning behind that. But I'm not convinced. Given this, I'm not convinced that that's what we're doing. Well, I've, he's you, you know you. Have, it, I think the the, know, the word happenstance comes to mind. You know, like his he wants that appearance that that this is like a, 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 a random moment at a, at a nightclub, and and so everything that happened. You know, you click the button of the camera, and sometimes you find something that's that's uh, strangely a coincidence. You know, that it fell where it fell at the time that you hit the button or whatever. Yeah. But for the most part, it's it's just. A captured moment and I, and I think he he kind of worked hard to make it that yeah well I mean and, and they give that appeal they definitely do I, I mean it's hard to look at any of his paintings and not feel like oh you know what that's a place I would hang out that's a place that I would that, that's obviously a party going on you know that kind of thing he definitely captures atmosphere that's for sure yeah and, and uh, you know there's something nice about you know let's let's step back to what one of the big differences I see in his work and Degas when you talk about these type of things is he wants to show you the happiness, the excitement in it, right? Whereas yeah. Degas sort of showed you the sadness in it, right? Fair enough, yeah. I mean, the, the, those those absinthe drinkers do not look like they're having a great time. Yeah. Well, and, and here, who doesn't look like they're having fun? I mean, maybe this woman in the front looks like she's concerned about something, but I I still think she's having fun. I think that I think that, that goes back to what we were saying before about his works are like escapism for for him. You know, right. that, that he's trying to let the world know that this is how he gets his I don't want to say he gets his rocks off, but this is this is how he tries <laughs> to forget about the problems. You know what I mean? I'm sure he got his rocks off, but you know what I mean? <laughs> Hey, let's quickly go to the next picture. <laughs> so the the last one we got is a poster. Right, and we should say that there were many, many, many of this type of poster that he did uh, lith through lithography. Um, and this is just one of many, many. I mean, he was well known for these posters. And they're and fantastic, so many, as he should be. I mean, they're very good posters. But... And so, so many of them, you know were known throughout the city of Paris to, you know, advertise certain, I mean, people saw these, these were used, they were, they were, they were known. Everybody yeah. knew about them. So you, you picked this one and, and I want you to talk to, to why you picked it. Cause I mean, I do like it, but I want, I, I want to hear what your thoughts are on this. Cause I had, in fairness to everybody, and as Dennis said, there's hundreds of these, right? There's lots of them. I have never seen this one until you brought it up to me. So, so talk about it a little bit. All right. Well, and there's this one, and there's actually another one that I, I find I just like. Well, let, let me. You know, we, we've talked about other artists at this time period, and how in France at this time they were very they were enamored by the print ma the prints that were made by the Japanese, right? Okay. Um, and so this whole show, I, you can see the word ja Japanese, which I believe is you know the French word for Japanese. Right. Um, so this is advertising a show that's actually something to do with um, with something Japanese, um, but the style of the of the lith lithograph I think is supposed to you know imitate a lot of these. I think he he took influence from those Japanese woodblock prints. Yeah. 
So that that being said, you know, you have to simplify these things down and you have to use a limited color palette, right? Because lithography is is done with with plates and and you you can't just, you know, it's not like having a palette with your all your different colors of the paint on it and just slapping them on there. Right. So there's something about the process of lithography that we could really get into to explain some of this but I don't think that's what, where we should go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, the, we, we don't have that kind of time, right? right. It's, a pretty, it's a pretty involved process involving like chemicals and stones and things like that where you, you etch it into the, to the stone and all this, but we won't, we won't get into all that. So, so what, what really moves me about this piece, though, is simply the composition of it, I think, is, is fantastic. You've got this woman and, I suppose, her companion or maybe just the person sitting next to her, I'm not sure, sitting, you know, and they're in pretty good detail um and then everything beyond them of course there's like her little changed purse or something sitting on the edge of the thing in front of her yeah um then everything beyond her is kind of silhouetted as if you know as sort of the way you do see things when you're at a theater but you can see like silhouettes of the conductor and of the string basses and maybe cello or something in the in the orchestra pit yeah and then you get to the stage beyond that, and there's the figure of a woman whose head doesn't even make it in the frame, right? It's, it's like <laughs> out off the top. So I just think it's a very unique and unusual composition that, again, you know, yeah. speaks to his, his, uh, his drafting and, and his ability to draw and all that. Yeah, I... I... I see what you're saying with the limiting himself on purpose. I also think that his caricaturization of like bodies fits this well because he's got these flat planes, you know, these flat areas and his very liquidy kind of line to outline her dress, her elbow, they have to be spot on or else it won't translate. Right. Right, right. And then like her hat is another good example. That could just be, if that was done, any differently, it could just be perceived as a big mess. No, you know what I mean? Like, like, like somebody torched her hair, you know, or something yeah. like that. And then, and then I love this middle area because it almost feels like, like the blob is coming out of that orchestra pit. You know what I mean? Like, like, you know what they're supposed to be. You know that there's a hand there, you know that there's two um, string instruments, things like that. And, but if you weren't paying attention, they would almost be like someone was pushing through plastic or something. You know what I mean? Right. To, to push those things out, and they seem very surreal to me. Well, another funny thing about it is that you know it's a function. It's a it's a matter of function over anything. He's got this woman wearing a dark hat and a dark yeah uh, dress, I guess. So you know maybe that color of her dress and the hat would have been appropriate for the silhouettes of of the, everything in front of her, but. But that would have just stopped that you know that would have that would have stopped the image. Yeah, yeah, it would have killed it. Yeah. And there's a nice there's a nice connection between what she's wearing and the gloves on the woman on stage. I mean, they're, they're similar in, in tone. So yeah. so you draw that you know you draw that jump. You make that leap from her to, to the stage. The the other interesting thing that has nothing to do with the image itself is it's interesting that it's a advertisement for something Japanese. But there's not really any emphasis on anything Japanese. I mean, it's really it's really the crowd that's French. That's the people they already know. And so the so the lure of this fascination with Japan is not really, you know, taken advantage of to any big degree. No, but I bet if we did a, a, did some research on, you know, it, it tells you that again, my French is limited. But it, I I think we can we can make a, a pretty strong assumption that this Ed. Fournier down the bottom is the director of the. <laughs> no, but I, I. But what I'm saying is they don't show a. And again, forgive me because I don't know what the show would be about. But you know they don't exactly show uh, Kabuki warriors on stage or anything. They're they're showing the crowd. Right. He's he, you're right. He's advertising it as just a, a stage show, and and you don't know anything about the story. He's not giving you anything about the story. I don't know how typical that was in France at that time. You're, right. Today it wouldn't sell. Right. Right. Exactly. Cause, you don't go to a show because it's just a show. I mean, maybe back then people did, and that, and that's that's the difference. But but now uh, you're right. We need to know. You need to you need to sell it because there's something very interesting in the show itself. Right. 
So no, but that, that's great. I love the colors. I mean, that's the easiest thing for me to to latch onto. I mean, he always has these these. Uh, I gotta say it again. These orange and red haired women, like all the time. He had, definitely had a fascination with that. Yeah. Um, and then also, you know, I mean, the, this is bourgeois life, right? This is the nightlife at the time of yep. people going out and entertaining themselves, and that definitely was right up his alley. Right. I think that's the, that's the angle that he took on on this, and that's it's. It's not always, if you look at a lot of his posters, it's not always the way he goes, but he did do it this way a number of times. Yeah. Other it's ones, good. you know, if they're about a, a, I'm thinking of one where there's actually a character, you know, of probably of the show, por so somewhat of a portrait of him, you know, that's the poster. And, and it, it's a lithograph too, so it's very simplified and, and on a limited palette, but it, it's pretty dynamic because he's got a big scarf on and, um, oh, that's the guy. Yeah, that's the one everybody's always seen of the yeah. of the guy with the big hat and everything. I think it's called uh, Aristide Bruant or something like that. Um, let's see if I can find it. But yeah, I mean that's 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 maybe where he's not showing the crowd. But he did some some of these type of posters for the Moulin Rouge, and they're very, they're similar to the paintings where there's a dancer and somebody watching the dancers and a crowd behind the dancer. You know. Yeah. Um, it, it's really about the nightlife, I think. Oh yeah, no, I, I, for sure, that's definitely his his take on things. So good. Well, I mean, just to top it off, he, uh, um, so he died young, and this, uh, and he still made a good amount of work for a guy who died very young, to be honest with you. Um, and then, uh, what well, it was a combination of like alcoholism. He was an alcoholic. That was another yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, and, and very destructive. There was there was nothing for him to like. You know, I, I don't I don't picture that you saw him, you know, going out for his morning jogs or or taking his trips. <laughs> no, to him. no, not at all. But in fact, they named uh, he he invented a drink. <laughs> There's a drink that he called an earthquake, <laughs> which uh, which is half uh, and I don't think you could have it here because it's half um, absinthe. And half something else, but but he was he is accredited for inventing the earthquake, <laughs> and uh, and actually cocktail drinks at the time were not like in favor, and he was one of these guys that really pushed it, like he was all in, interested in mixed drinks and all that stuff, and then um, uh, but he died between complications of alcoholism and syphilis, right, and then and then uh, all the medical problems and everything, right. But he, he, he was definitely I'm, outcast and and uh, and defiant. Not defiant. What's the right word? Um, rebellious. Rebellious uh, to the end. You know. I mean, I they. One of the things I read was one of his dying. You know, a dying quote was kind of like, uh, you know, to the degree of you know, his family's finally rid of him type thing. You know, that kind of thing. Like like he was just one of these guys that was just uh, a burden. Had a, yeah, had a miserable self worth and everything. You know. Yeah, I don't doubt it. I think that that you'd have to have that to sort of that that is one of the key pieces that would have to fit into the the puzzle of his life to make yeah. it what it was. No question about it. I mean, you just have to be you know, I don't really know how you could know. It's either, everybody's got their own take on it. If I had some kind of health issues, I would I would probably be I've got to do everything I can. You know, I've got to work harder than the average person right. to stay healthy. But but he saw it probably as, What's the I'm point? Not young anyway, so I may as well fit as much stuff in here and do as much, you know, behave as reckless, recklessly as I can for as long as I can. And, and, and if you have the money to do it, I mean, we still see that today with Hollywood and stuff. If you have the money to be reckless, they choose to be reckless. That, that yeah. ends up being part of it. And he had the money, so. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, well, great. That's uh, that's another uh, great episode with Lutrec. Thank you. Um, I mean, any any last words on Lutrec that we didn't hit on? The only thing I would maybe add is is that you know another very controversial thing he spent a lot of his time doing. We talked about the prostitutes, but there's a whole series of paintings he did with with like prostitutes together in bed and all this. Which oh was yeah. Of Even today, that would be very distasteful and, and very somewhat sh well, yeah. mostly shocking. Um, so I, sp I have to believe, you know, in, in, in 1890s, whatever, whenever he painted them, that that had to have been very, very shocking. Yeah, no, you're very, I saw some of those as, as I was going through these and you're right there, even today, 
uh, especially today knowing the time frame he painted, so that's me looking at it, uh, you're right. That would have been like uh, very, very shocking, especially at the time. I think I think his his you know we can we can place our own thoughts on why he was interested in doing this, but you know he could relate. Yeah. You know I, I think he saw you know uh, the life of a prostitute as as not a happy life and you know their way of consoling one another and and he could relate to this you know so I, I'm thinking that's what what motivated him to do that, but I know he did a whole series of them and and I know that it's a, it's an important chapter in his work that we're not even you know Touching probably on, tastefully yeah. so tastefully choosing not to to yeah. really dive into yeah no i agree uh, it, it wasn't my choice but it happened to work out that way right? <laughs> so, so yes uh, so yes i'll take the moral high ground so we didn't want to show that stuff here right and, 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 and to, to 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 further you know to make it as if we weren't really you know working too hard at that choice a lot of them at that point of his career were very simple. I mean, not they don't look like finished pieces. They're very yes. loose, and um, so you know we do here at the uh, at the uh, m the modern family tree. Yeah. We try to pick sort of more finished looking work, and and that uh, those pieces generally don't look all that finished. That that's very true. And 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 in all honesty, not knowing much about those works, there was a part of me that wondered if they were commissioned or per. You know, not necessarily. Um, competed or anything like that I, I didn't know well i don't either really i don't because if you go back to corbet corbet had some images like that but they were all commissioned for someone's private use right and these may have been too maybe the same maybe the same person like you know needed somebody beyond corbet i have no right. idea <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah hey my old perv is dead so i need a new perv <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and there was no like magazines then that i know of that were uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, there, there was there was a lot more imagination back then. That's all. <laughs> so, all right, great. Well, what a what a way to end Lutrec's podcast. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> so, yes, digression, perfect. Yeah, I think that's, that says it all. That's right. So, all right, well, thanks a lot, Dennis, and uh, until you, next time. Yep, thanks. I'll talk to you. Bye. -bye.